<laughs> Thank you. So maybe I'll just say I'm kind of, indeed, this is, I think, maybe my fourth in-person uh, Libra Graphics. I've kind of come in and out. Actually, I'm living in Brussels and actually part of Constant, which was kind of connected to 2010, actually, when uh, Libra Graphics uh, was in Brussels. Um, and I think London, though, was the last one that I was in physically. Um, so I'm, yeah, uh, happy to be a part of this network and happy, really, to be back in person. Um, I'm going to present something which is called Seamful Pedagogies, Embracing a Heterogeneous Approach to Design and Art Education with Open Source Tools, which is a very uh, uh, nice uh, formal title. Actually, in fact, this is kind of the subtext why I teach with image magic instead of processing. And I'm going to say a little caveat here. It's meant to be a bit provocative. Uh, I'm, I, I'm the kind of person who loves to critically look at things. I can ruin people's films experiences afterwards. <laughs> and I have to sometimes kind of check indeed with people. It uh, doesn't mean I don't like it. It's just I like to tear it apart. Um, so yeah, it's uh, actually meant to be a critique of sort of a pedagogic approach and, and, and also a way to talk about positively uh, what we're using. So I'm a, a teacher in a program called Experimental Publishing, which is in Rotterdam at the Willem de Koning Academy. And this uh, presentation is based on an essay that I wrote um, in assignment for uh, this project called Vernaculars Come to Matter, uh, which is edited by um, Christina Cochior, Sofia uh, Torres, and Ma uh, Manetta Behrens, uh, all of whom have some connections as well to uh, both Christina and Manetta teach in our course. And that's the link, which sadly, indeed, the link that's in the uh, website is broken because the wiki's down, which is, uh, it's, uh, it was done with an organization called Varia, uh, which uh, made this project, which is also a local organization based in Rotterdam, uh, again, where I teach. So I'm going to try to, uh, I read, <laughs> in preparation, I read this essay just out loud, and it took like a half an hour. I'm not going to do that because, indeed, it's a terrible experience, I can tell you, uh, just because, indeed, it's kind of a dense essay. And, and anyway, I want to try to leave some room. So I'm going to try to present the kind of main argument um, and then leave, hopefully, room to show some examples of work uh, that comes from XPUB uh, students, actually current students. So processing. I think probably everybody knows of it. Um, it bills itself as a free open source programming language and environment used by students, artists, designers, architects, researchers, and hobbyists for learning, prototyping, and production. Processing is developed by artists and designers as an alternative to proprietary software tools in the same domain. The project integrates a programming language, development environment, and teaching methodology into a unified structure for learning and exploration. So this is like the introduction in Casey Rios and Ben Fry's Processing a Programming Handbook. Actually, when I went to write the article, it ended up becoming very much based on actually the text, pedagogic texts for teaching, lang for teaching uh, software and, and uh, programming for artists. Um, and so, yeah, I start from this. And I like this idea about, indeed, this integrated programming language environment and teaching methodology. But again, I don't, I don't particularly like processing. So to give a little bit of context, Muriel Cooper was a um, uh, designer for the MIT Press. And uh, just as a kind of little intro to the origins of processing, um, really reinvented, brought a whole kind of design aesthetic to the MIT Press, which at, in the 70s was not particularly well known for, for kind of design work. And, and one of the most famous designs that she made was this catalog of the Bauhaus. And you may know her as well as the uh, origin. Uh, she created this MIT Press logo, which indeed is this very uh, strong. It's a stylized version of the letters MITP, which is kind of a funny thing, which you don't ne necessarily immediately see, but very much in that kind of uh, abstract Bauhaus maybe style. Unfortunately, Muriel, so Muriel had a thing called the Visible Language Workshop at the MIT Media Lab in, in the 90s, where I studied as well. and. Um, she died, sadly, at a young age. Uh, and John Maeda came uh, and uh, replaced uh, her and started a new program, uh, first called Aesthetics and Computation. And Casey Rias and Ben Fry were among his students. And, and they created a system together called Design by Numbers. And this is actually a book that was published in 1999. 
So in that introduction uh, to that book, uh, Maida writes, our forefathers at the Bauhaus, Ulm, and many other key centers for design education around the world labored to create a sense of order and method to their teaching. Thanks to their trailblazing work, teaching at the university level gradually became accepted as a meaningful and constructive activity. A drawing board, small or large, became the stage for paper, pen, ink, and blade to interact in the disciplined activity that characterized the profession of visual design. So here's that direct link to, to kind of Bauhaus heritage. Um, the system itself was extremely constrained. Uh, it had a fixed 100 by 100 pixel canvas, monochrome only graphics. There were commands like paper and pen to control the different foreground and background colors in values of 0 to 100. Um, and the print publication also had a square format. And as a kind of description of its aesthetic, uh, the book also has this. When designing this system for learning basic computational media design, I intentionally limited the set of commands and constructs to a minimal number of possibilities. If I had given you drawing capability beyond a line or setting a dot, the examples could have been more exciting, but the point could not be made clearly because your attention would be drawn to the picture and not to the code. So there's this kind of statement of sort of code is what matters uh, in this, uh, and, and sort of a reason for being minimalist is to reduce the code. A particular spread that I find telling, and, and again that I will critique, is this presentation of a vase. So there's an image of a vase, uh, again, in this very monochrome, black and white, 100 pixel square thing, and you're shown its code, which is basically a series of set x, y, 100, which is then black. So it's a basically a big list of pixels and their x, y coordinates over two or more pages. I forget how long it is. When I saw this, well, first of all, I'm critical of this because I think, OK, there's no way, you know, discipline <laughs> be damned. John Maeda did not create this image by typing in these numbers and testing it out and playing with it. He used some kind of program. He reduced it. He probably, you know, it's clearly dithered, which is a technique you need to use to have uh, a kind of gray values that uh, appear. This is clearly a kind of fetishization of code, and this book is, no one's going to use this other than just having it on their coffee table and say, look, code is interesting. It made me think a little bit about my own experience as a kid uh, growing up, and you had like Compute Magazine. You'd, uh, I would sit with friends who had like Commodores, because uh, uh, who had a Commodore computer, and you could type these things in. And even here, for instance, I, it made me think, and again, that's 99. This is 84. Um, here, what's interesting, I think, is you see, as you type in this program that's going to generate this fantastic hyperbolic para paraboloid um, on your Commodore or VIC-20 or who knows what it was made for, um, what's interesting is you had a kind of proofreader program that you would type in first, in fact, that would then uh, actually, every time you, t when you typed a line, it would give uh, a checksum, which is then printed in the magazine, which actually was a way to help you kind of know that you typed exactly the right data. So it's just actually this kind of reminder of actually, this is actually what code looks like that is meant to be typed in and actually consumed in some way and, and, and used. Um, and again, I found that connection to that, these particular sets of practices kind of telling and, and interesting and strangely missing from the whole processing discussion. There's no discussion of how that image was made. So Zoom Ahead, Processing Book 2007. Uh, Maeda students Reese and Fry create processing in Java, which indeed is a desktop application existing outside of the web, but which you could use to publish applets uh, in, in web pages. Processing, um, ah, so Actually, yeah, this may be out of order. Processing uh, also has a kind of minimalism in that uh, there's basically two functions, the setup function and the draw function. Setup function gets called once, and then the draw function gets called continuously. Um, and if you look at the book, indeed, again, you have this kind of very, I'd say, modernist, minimalist aesthetic with the square, monochrome, mostly monochrome images, uh, geometric shapes. So again, we have a bit of a similar def uh, uh, 
reasoning for the minimalism. So here it says, most of the examples presented in this book have a minimal visual style. This represents not a limitation of the processing software, but rather a conscious decision by the authors to make the code for each example as brief and clear as possible. We hope the stark quality of these examples give exam uh, additional incentive to the reader to extend the programs to hit her or his own visual language. So despite the claim <laughs> of this leaving space for others to bring their own visual language, I would challenge the fact that it's that somehow processing is neutral, uh, which is kind of w one reading of that, as if it's sort of, you know, we do not muddy ourselves in the waters of details like implementation. Um, and this is something, yeah, that, that is echoed in other kinds of work that I've seen from Casey Rias, talking about software structures and somehow this idea that you can have ideas of software that are really completely separate from particular implementations. So the framework valorizes smoothness and fluidity, which leads to one kind of idea of interactivity, which is very surface, very in response. There are commands you know, to draw basic shapes, but also to respond to the mouse, the keyboard. Um, so it produces a certain kind of thing. Um, and in particular, at also, and the little brief segue here, processing is now, uh, interestingly, so Lauren Lee McCarthy actually has really sort of with lead on reprogramming processing to be JavaScript based because initially, again, it was Java applets, which then have been uh, technically detail <laughs> has become uh, obsolete. Um, and now P5 is actually the way that most people would use processing, uh, which then translate this into JavaScript. Um, but the experience I have in actually working with it is, for instance, one of the classic kind of things that happens when you do some kind of animation is as soon as you maybe write some kind of code, you know, the problem with actually the setup, the draw function, which is very simple, it hides the details of the fact that there's a loop happening and that it's connected by default to the kind of frame rate of the computer, which again, the value is let's make it maximum, let's make it 60 times a second. So the problem is as a beginner, a programmer, it's very easy to write code that doesn't maybe that takes longer than a 60th of a second. And what starts to happen is you get lag. And sadly, when I see people using processing, you always get this horrible moment where they're like, oh, my computer is too slow, which breaks my heart because it's not a question of the technology being not capable. It's just sort of bad decisions in and a kind of a framework that doesn't really let you understand how you're working with time and to maybe make decisions about how you work with time. There are ways to work around it. And of course, you can change the frame rate. Um, but again, I think it's just a question to me of, of where a certain maybe oversimplification has happened that, that then creates a whole set of problems. I mean, a whole other thing to say here quickly is implicitly too, uh, P5 is still based on a canvas element. So like, and that again, that kind of heritage is coming from an applet, which is this kind of alien being that sort of transplanted into a web page, but for the rest doesn't really know about the DOM or any kind of the structure of HTML or CSS. I think P5 still has that. I mean, I think they're making, and P5 is a great project and really community oriented, but still I think suffers a bit from that, that heritage. Um, and for instance, to say, why don't you use an SVG? Which for instance, you know, my classic kind of processing is, is it's if you want to make a, a graphic that sort of responds based on the different elements of the graphic, SVG was, is a much more interesting representation because you have uh, sort of hooks for that and processing, you go into a whole kind of hit testing world of code and other libraries to sort of help. So, yeah. So by chance, I was in Amsterdam at the launch. This is a little bit of an anecdote that though I find telling. Um, I, I was there at the book launch uh, of the processing book. Casey Rias was there. I was in the back of the room. I'd happened to go to Computer Collectif, which was a fantastic technical bookstore in Amsterdam that no longer exists, but picked up this book, Image Magic Tricks from uh, Sohail Salehi. It's a packed book. And I happened to have it with me. And, and I was talking with Casey Reese, and, I, and he saw it, and he said, oh, what's that? And I showed it to him, and he had never heard of Image Magic, which I thought was interesting. So the story of Image Magic, I think, is telling. So this is from the website of Image Magic that tells its history, sadly, as well. I had to access through the archive uh, web, uh, way back machine. So Image Magic started with a request from my, this is John Christie, the initial author who writes this in the history. 
ImageMagic started with a request from my DuPont supervisor, uh, David Pensack, to display computer-generated images on a monitor only capable of showing 256 unique colors simultaneously. In 1987, monitors that could display 24-bit true color were rare and quite expensive. It goes on and so he says, I turned to Usenet for help, asking for an algorithm to reduce 24-bit to 256. Paul Raveling of the USC Information Systems responded not only with a solution, but one that was already in source code, available from an FTP site. So over the course of the next few years, I had frequent opportunities to get help uh, with other computer science problems. And eventually, I felt so compelled to give thanks for my help, I uh, published the software for free. And a bit like in a repetition of, you like, Unix was free because AT&T didn't care. Well, DuPont didn't care about its chemical companies, so why not release your software? Uh, it's not in our interest. And this is then the origin of image magic. So if you go to the website, and again, this is an older version, still online, but not the default <laughs> documentation, but the, the old style usage, um, you get an overview of image magic, which is the software is very different. It's also text-based in the sense of like processing is also code that's text-based. But it's text that you typically write on the command line. It's something that exists in this kind of context of uh, command line software. And also typically is used to sort of work from, say, an existing image. So a classic kind of image magic one-liner is, as uh, is described, you can do stuff like reduce the amount of color in an image. And so if you go into the documentation uh, for image magic and you see how you can uh, change the palette, you start to learn about things like dithering, actually, which indeed is a technique. And in fact, there's more than one algorithm for dithering. It's Lord Steinberg, uh, Remersma. So again, pedagogically, I find this interesting in that it's like, it's a, it's, it's, so image magic is then a gateway to actually learn about these underlying uh, material things. In Salehi's so book, actually, it's very interesting because, uh, yeah, he goes through a whole bunch of just different descriptions, but already just aesthetically, I think it's very far away from that kind of clean, modernist aesthetic. He gives this example of like rendering no more war as a slogan with a dripping font, then applying uh, using this kind of gradient image to then deform it and then project it onto a chess piece. So it's this kind of great kind of sequence of funny manipulations to then get an effect. And he also describes like generating an e-card e -card maker actually with uh, PHP and HTML. Uh, there's also actually this whole description of making a flag, which I really love which you kind of sense the sort of materiality, even though it's digital, uh, in the commands where you're skewing and, uh, yeah, shearing and uh, compositing just to basically create what's in effect very geometric form. So again, a very different approach from a list of XY coordinates or, or some kind of uh, even just geometric primitives. So, to put again into a kind of different context, so um, 1923, over 100 years ago, El Lizitsky, uh is an uh, avant-gardist uh, who uh, fled from uh, the Soviet Union to uh, uh, Berlin, was based in Berlin, and actually uh, was making uh, work that was very influential of this kind of nascent Bauhaus uh, uh, that would form. And this particular piece I find interesting, it's often talked about as constructivist. Uh, constructivism is kind of a global uh, movement within the arts, uh, but one of the kind of characteristics of it is this kind of working misuse of, of materials. So here he's using actually the technology of the time to make books, which, and is actually using the blind material. So there's pieces of metal that you use to separate uh, metal type, uh, you know, between the lines. And actually he's, in making it in such a way so that it's creating a positive element. So what should be hidden is actually then printed and creates this kind of uh, poetic forms with these elements. And actually this particular book is called For the Voice. It was a collection of poets by Mayakovsky, who was a friend of his. Uh, and, and so it's all kind of invoking this idea of, of performance, of poetry. Also beautiful in that it has this great interface along the side of the book with kind of tabbed icons to make it kind of interactive. So leap forward into the 1970s. Seymour Papert uh, is uh, somebody with a background in child uh, psychology, um, but is working at MIT. 
uh, and is making Logo, actually, uh, a, a programming language, and actually a whole is developing with actually a whole team of people uh, a pedagogy for teaching mathematics and programming. And part of that was this, if you see this little guy here, is a sort of the famous turtle, which initially was actually a physical robot turtle that could do basic things like move, had a pen in it, and it could go pen up and pen down were commands and turn left and go forward. And so indeed, through writing your uh, logo code, you would, uh, command this turtle to make drawings. So in Mindstorms, which is uh, Papert's book from 1980 that really describes uh, the ideas around, around this work, he says the following. The process reminds one of tinkering. Learning consists of building up a set of materials and tools that one can handle and manipulate. Perhaps most central of all, it's a process of working with what you've got. This is the science of the concrete, where the relationships between natural objects in all other combinations and recombinations provide a conceptual vocabulary for building scientific theories. Here, I am suggesting that in the most fundamental sense, we as learners are all bricoleurs. So this is a really important concept. He uses this idea of brico, bricoleur, which I find funny actually now living in Brussels, I have this other take of brico is a bit used as a sort of, you know, bricolage is a way to say something is maybe not super well thought out and uh, kind of sh questionable quality. But here, absolutely, uh, Papert is embracing it as really a significant way of thinking and, a, and, and actually a way that science works as well, not something different from science. He's saying it is, like mathematicians as well are bricoleurs, actually, in how they think. And actually, the example that he gives is of thinking about a circle. So this is a bit, this is a clip from a kind of documentary that was made that showed actually how teachers were teaching with Logo. Basically, this classic example is, for instance, to, to draw a circle from a logo sense, if you're thinking about a turtle to draw it, you, would, you could think about, well, it's kind of like you take a little step forward and then you make a little turn and then you repeat that. You just keep like making a little step turn, little step turn, little step turn. And if you do that, you make uh, a circle. And that's something that's completely different from geometry where you get this equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared and in the worst variation even oh my god if it's not centered at the origin then you've got as well two other variables there and Papert really used hones in on this to say look this is this is a terrible way to teach mathematics it's so abstract it's so formal there's no kind of sense of of relationship that you can make to this and certainly not as a as a nine-year-old kid who's thrown this and so, and in fact, actually, the idea of like, well, in fact, it's a bit like take a little step and turn a little, that's actually also really connected in a very fundamental way to certain kinds of mathematics, like differential uh, calculus, in a way that actually this kind of algebraic expression completely misses. So that is something that I think about, again, when I see <laughs> things like this, which is like, oh, God, x, y coordinates to define a triangle, really? I mean, it's such a, it's such a, actually a particular representation that's not not particularly interesting. So in the book, it's fantastic in that it expands this whole dialogue between students who are trying to make a flower. And actually, they have a kind of, uh, they say, oh, let's try to use what we already have. Oh, we have a procedure that makes a quarter circle. Uh, well, how can we put it together? They make a mistake. Oh my god, it's a bird. It's, they, for, they turned the wrong uh, number of degrees and uh, uh, oh, but we made a bird, that's nice. So then they kind of integrate that into like, okay, we build our, our garden and then eventually it's a garden with like a, a, a whole sky of birds. And again, like for Papert, this is all an example again of that sort of like make do, work with bugs, you know, debugging as part of programming and, and sort of way that also generates ideas um, and not something that needs to be cleaned up and hidden away uh, in terms of thinking about the process. So, and I'm realizing indeed, I want to get to the uh, uh, I, the last part to show some stuff, but um, uh, in thinking about this, we actually, I came across this text, which I'll just put here, a uh, great text called uh, Misplaced Concretism and Concrete Situations. Um, so Susan Lee Start, who's written about like categorization and she's a very interesting uh, researcher who, who looked at uh, infrastructure and information technology. So she describes actually a set of what, what she defines as feminist method. 
And the points there are experiential and collective basis, processual nature, honoring contradictions and partialness, uh, situated historicity, sorry, now I'm realizing my, uh, with great attention to detail and specificity, and the application of all the points uh, together. So these were things that, again, in trying to think about what is a pedagogy of using free software, I found uh, really resonant. Um, and in the essay, actually, I have a big conclusion, which I'm not going to read through because, again, I want to show the nice things, uh, which are the student work. But in a nutshell, I think you get maybe hints of, of what I'm talking about, you know, this kind of idea of really embracing the materiality of things, which, by the way, was part of the Bauhaus. So to return just to that, I mean, I think shortly said, you know, avoid aestheticizing something like the Bauhaus without thinking about why they were doing what they were doing. You know, Albers did things with squares to, to talk about perception of color, not because he loved squares, you know, and, and or, or indeed that they work in a certain kind of context. Um, and, and so in that sense, be, I would be, I'm suspicious of a kind of minimalism when you, you know, you always have to question why and what are you minimalizing and what are you hiding? Uh, and think about, indeed, the constraints of, of the systems you're working with. It's actually really important and uh, generative, actually. So like I said, I'm uh, part of XPUB, which is this two-year master program that uh, makes things public and creates publics in an age of post-digital networks. In fact, we put a lot of emphasis on critical engagement with tools, DIY. We use free software like uh, pretty exclusively, at least in terms of teaching. Um, and we also have a real interest in co the collective work, so doing with others alongside DIY uh, practices, which is also something that we get inspired with with free software, again, as a culture of sharing, as a culture of kind of giving, uh, giving things back. Um, yeah, we have a particular kind of attitude uh, that we like to uh, express. So yeah, we're, we're in, you know, they, the, uh, we're in an art school that has Adobe installed on everything and all the licenses paid for. Um, but we're interested in questioning that and saying, OK, what else can we, how can we work with other tools and work differently? This was actually really like yesterday. We had an example as well of a collective uh, drawing program. This was something made during one of the lockdowns with BBB, which is this kind of Jitsi or Zoom-like uh, software that has a shared canvas and expresses a little bit of the ambivalence that we encourage in our, with our students. Uh, it's OK to, uh, to uh, be frustrated. One of the ways we work, too, though, is working with what we call sandboxes. So this is a Raspberry Pi. Um, each year, the students uh, work on maintaining uh, and setting up uh, their own server. And we like that kind of, again, physicality of it, like saying, OK, indeed, here is a server, and we're going to put it online um, through some tricks, of uh, which I can talk about if you're interested privately, about how to make these things public as well, um, but basically also focusing on it as a shared server. Uh, we have, you know, uh, web server uh, Nginx there, and people have their home folders. Um, one little detail, ah, this was actually a really nice zine that one of the students made, which I really liked, that they, part of the process is to name it. This one, this year's became Chop Chop. Uh, but one of the students, Anita, uh, then en ended up creating a whole kind of story around how there was a bird called Chip Chip and ate some raspberries and became Chop Chop. And so there's a, a nice uh, zine that was made for that. Also, just in terms of software, again, if you're interested, I can go into very deep detail, uh, but I'll just show it uh, on the surface here. I mean, a funny thing that we used is uh, we teach Py uh, Python, so we installed at some point Jupyter, which is this version of IPython. It's a web server that allows you to create so-called notebooks that work with Python code, um, which is very handy for teaching. Uh, but actually, it's a bit of a Trojan horse. This, it's, it's developed into something called Jupyter Lab now. And it has an editor with syntax coloring. You have a file manager. You can drop files onto it. Um, it has, in fact, the ability to put shell commands into notebooks. So this is a notebook I made to work with image magic. So the little exclamation marks are when you execute the cell, because it's kind of like a spreadsheet. You sort of go and you, you run different cells. You get the output uh, instead of what would normally happen in a command line becomes something that's then a web-based uh, experience. So very uh, low threshold way for, for people to start being involved with uh, the command line without necessarily having to go to the scary 
uh, black terminal, which but which comes then later as a as a way to say, okay, well actually this is, and actually the scary black terminal is also something that's in Jupiter Lab. I mean, you can create a terminal, which then gives you complete access, and you can install software as I'm doing here. Everyone is pseudo on the server because it's a sandbox. That's the idea that it's not something that's uh, necessary to keep running for production. So we use a whole bunch of different softwares. But uh, just so last to finish uh, some examples of work, Platform is the Problem is a really beautiful uh, book from uh, Senka and Riviera, uh, two current uh, first year students, looking at, and it's here, uh, it's a beautiful kind of like flip book that has kind of features, implications, and alternatives as kind of three structures that you can sort of literally flip around and consider different possibilities. Uh, all laid out with context as well, actually, which is kind of interesting detail and uh, produced in-house with laser cutting. Um, this was the installation of, the, uh, of a project called Peripheral Centers and Feminist Servers, also with Varia, uh, the link to this publication. And just the thing here that I thought was interesting was that they found a way to sort of, again, sort of making a sort of imaginary around the computer and this idea of like a kitchen inside the computer that became a zine, but it also became like a game that used the file system and that actually in a kind of interesting way was Python scripts that were running and then in a way similar to the way Jupyter makes its shell web-based, it, it makes the what happens in a, in a Python script running on the server visible on a website. It's also a huge security hole, but <laughs> which is something you have to deal with. And the last thing, which I think just kind of nicely connects maybe to the turtle graphics and also maybe a bit of a bridge to I see Kais from OSP, who was part of this. Um, so we have a huge uh, section of plotters, the plotter station. We're really interested in this kind of idea of media archaeology too, as a way to, let's say, question how we got to where we are by saying, you know, actually, let's consider a plotter as, a, as an interesting uh, set of choices that, that uh, is not very active anymore, but actually they all exist and they're often broken. And if you know how to fix them, you end up with a pile of them. And uh, that's what we did. And indeed, it's one of nice moment from we had a plotter party at OSP. And this is actually the work of Clara, whose family name I don't know. But Busto? Pasto. Pasto. Thank you. And, and I just really liked it because at some point it was indeed plotting a circle and I overheard a conversation where they're saying, oh, look, it, it actually can't really draw curves. Like, because in fact, you get that sense of the turtle graphic that is basically what it's doing is like little line, little line, little line, little line, little line. It has this kind of funny way of approximating circles, uh, which is something that you get when you actually just actually uh, try to program it. And the final kind of caveat, which I just found funny, Tice, uh, one of our uh, XPOP students, uh, has been working a lot on actually cross-hatching algorithms, so translating bitmap images into then what can be plotted with, because you have only the colors that you have on your pens. Um, and the funny thing is, at some point he, he was presenting it and he had to apologize because he said, oh yeah, sorry, Michael, I made it with processing. <laughs> and actually, I think that's great, actually, because it's to say, indeed, my critique is not so much with processing, but again, it's more actually about like the way of working with these tools and the way you're thinking. And if processing is indeed part of your toolkit, all the better, yeah. So that's it, thanks.